welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge. Hi, I'm Mindy Silva. Welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge Highlights Reel. I have Anna Bartkowski from the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia. I was hoping to have Cheryl Hess, the Wiki Tree Challenge captain for the week, um, but she was unavailable today. Cheryl is also the coordinator for the Hess Roots One Name Study Project and the project coordinator for both the um, Portugal Project and for the Wiki Tree Challenge. So welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mindy. I'm going to talk a little bit about WikiTree first for those viewers that don't know who we are. For those people, our mission is to grow one accurate shared tree that connects us all and is accessible to everyone free forever. It's all about collaboration. There's one profile per person. If you and I share an ancestor, we work on that profile together. It's not what you, that you have your tree and I have my tree. It's all one big global tree. And did I mention it's free? We just passed that 33 million profile milestone with almost 11 million of those having DNA connections attached to them. What makes WikiTree really work is its community. And a cornerstone of the community is our honor code. Anyone can view profiles on WikiTree, but to edit more than close family member profiles, you have to sign the honor code. It emphasizes sources, gives credit, courtesy, understanding, accessibility, accuracy, and respecting privacy. Privacy is another aspect of WikiTree that makes it special. Even though we're growing a one world tree and we all collaborate, only close family members can collaborate on modern family profiles. As you go back in time, the privacy controls open up. Collaboration on deep ancestors is between distant cousins who are serious about genealogical research, careful about sources, and willing to see their research validated or invalidated with DNA. So if you aren't a member yet, come and join. It just takes a minute to register as guest member, and you can delete a guest account at any time. Well, we've now completed the sixth WikiTree challenge of 2023, and boy, was it a challenging <laughs> week. <laughs> Anna says, I know, I know. <laughs> You've well, been doing I, this research a lot longer than some of us, so. Well, our history is so unique. And, you know, the fact that we started off in the Germanic states before Germany was even a country, um, there certainly are records there, but they're not easy to find. And then for years, for many of us my age with Russia, you know, a lot of the records, we, we, there was a Cold War going on. So the fact that we can even get to some records there is wonderful. And um, still, it's a lot of going back, just getting that right village and getting the right place. So um, our organization has helped people, but we appreciate you know, in getting records and helping um, individuals track back. Um, however, it's nice to have a little help along the way, and I, we're grateful for your help, Mindy. Oh, thank you. You know, that's what we're here for. Um, so we have seven names. We had seven days to find out every one we could within seven degrees of each of these starting people. So seven degrees means seven steps away in any direction. On WikiTree, we call that account a person CC7. So our starting people were Lewis, Lucas, John Crest. We added 332 people to his lines. Gabriel Lorenz, an amazing 1,057 people were added. Friedrich Eichhorn, we added 589. Frederica Hoag Schlittenhart, 477. Johann Leonard Stumpf, we added 425 people. Uh, Philip Reichert, we added 347. And Carl Graber, although he was one of the toughest lines, Anna and I were talking about him before we started, uh, he gained 627 people. And, you know, six of these were born in the Russian Empire with one born in Bavaria, Germany. And, you know, Anna, you know how hard it is to do this research on these people and how important it is, you know, to go out and look at their fans. So their friends, associates, neighbors, and, you know, those peripheral relatives, because you never know what's going to pop up when you start going through those other, those other records. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, we try and build these connections out 
So now do you want to tell us how you chose the seven starting people and a little bit more about your organization? Well, we are, our mission is to collect anything and everything that has to do with Germans from Russia, from the culture to the history, um, to helping secure records um, so that people can track their families. And um, when, when we started, it was, it was kind of tricky when we decided to do this, and like, how do we select people? So we reached out on our Facebook page and we basically said, hey, we've got this opportunity. If you've hit a brick wall, you know, send us an email, give us as much as you can. And we must have gotten, I should have tallied it before the call, but we must have gotten over 25 entries. And we made sure every person um, that we selected was a member and in good standing. And then we, we tried to select little bit of different geographic areas, little bits of different, not all from the same village, not all from the same area. So I presented it to um, our group and got some recommendations. And, and these were the final seven that we decided that we picked to um, go through this. And welcome, Mike. I see you're here. <laughs> Glad you were able to join us. Thanks for inviting me. I, I, I may have to leave, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll stay here as long as I can. Thank you. I had a misunderstanding. I didn't realize that we, well, we could only invite eight people and one family has like, I don't know how many people have sent me emails um, for the Crest family. So I wasn't certain how, uh, once I found out that we could have eight people, I, I was a little late, but I apologize. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. I will go ahead and we will move on to here. Um, some of our top people during the challenge week. And we had Celia Marsh, who was our uh, most valuable participant or MVP. She was also the top bounty hunter this week. So she was adding crazy number of profiles. I believe she added more than 230 um, just on her own. Uh, wow. We had Pam Kreutzer, who did just some really incredible research, um, took great notes. And Lucy Salvaggio Diaz, they were also top bounty hunters. And what that is, is we give out special bounty points during the week. So, you know, the points isn't all what it's about, but it's kind of fun to add that little extra motivator and it lets people know how they're doing. So they get points for adding profiles, but they also have little special things they can do along the way. So, um, you know, like we pick a brick wall ancestor that's not necessarily your starting brick walls. Um, we pick one off in the branches for each of the seven lines. Uh, midweek and they get a chance to bust those walls down. And if they do, they get 10 points each for that. We also give uh, bounty points, which are special points to people that make the first connection to the global tree. So they're really highly motivated to connect these people out to the tree so we can see how they're related to everyone. And then finally, for the interesting finds and some of those you'll find in this presentation, uh, you know, we do a vote on that. I put a survey out on Wednesday and they get a chance to, everyone gets a chance to vote on it. And the top uh, seven from those get bounty points as well. So, you know, my hat's off to the people that uh, were able to get high points up in that bounty because they were busy wearing more than one hat during the week. And then, you know, it takes an entire team to collaborate and come up with these outstanding results. And we had more than 38 people participate just in an incredible show of uh, collaboration. And, you know, we keep live chat going in Discord during the week. And so, you know, depending what country people are from, uh, sometimes that just goes around the clock. But it's really fun if you don't know the research. We do have some people that come in and just audit the chat in order to improve their own family research in the future. And they just watch, you know, all of this uh, really interesting conversation go by and see where everybody, you know, is is looking for uh, records and if they're having any luck and what family lines they're working on. And it's really great. Now, we took a look at all of our starting ancestors and we didn't find any blood relations between them, but we did find connections. And we like mm -hmm. to look and see, you know, which ones are the most closely connected. So Gabriel Lorenz is 17 degrees from Carl Graber and 21 degrees from Philip Riker. 
Friedrich Eichhorn is 23 degrees from Philip Reichert. Mm -hmm. And Frederica Hoog is 18 degrees from Gabriel Lorenz and 19 degrees from Carl Graber. So that was kind of fun. And we play with this connection thing uh, a lot on Wikitree. So we like being able to look at it. We also like to follow along and see who we're the closest to. So here is the MVP of the week and her connection to Rika Hoag. It shows you the path used to reach her. And you can do this with any two connected people on Wikitree. And, you know, there were four connections where it swapped over by marriage. So not a blood relation. Um, but that's really not that that far off. A notable connection was found in Lorenz branches via Gabriel's daughter-in-law, Jocelyn. Eugene Field Kugler was a jack of all trades who owned the Kugler Tire Company in the mid 50s. He's 19 degrees from Ransom Eli Olds, and he's actually an eighth cousin once removed. So that is a blood relation. Plus, we can see how how many steps away he is, uh, whom the Oldsmobile and REO brands were named for, and 22 degrees from Horace Elgin Dodge, who invented, of course, one of the first all-steel cars in America with his brother, John Francis Dodge. So that was just kind of a fun and interesting tie-in. And then another one of the Icorn connections was Gary Neal Bo Steer, who went by Bo. He was born in 1945 in Winnipeg, Canada, married for 42 years when he died. He was remembered as being an avid skier who traveled around the world to play rugby with the Brits Lions and the Twilighters. Now, Bo is just three degrees from Friedrich Eichhorn. Hmm. We love our connections. <laughs> They're fun. <laughs> Now we're going to go through one by one and see our people. So we're going to start with some interesting finds and connections with Lewis John Cress, a.k.a. Lucas Cress. He was born in 1893 in Tolova in the Russian Empire. He migrated to the United States in 1913, a single farm laborer bound to Johann Wertz. We knew from the start that his parents' names were George Peter Cress and Katharina Wright Cress and that he possibly had 12 siblings. John McGill, one of our researchers, found what appears to be either the grandparent or great-grandparent of Lucas. Additional research was done by Corrine Goodman, who looked at the ship manifest and contacted fellow researchers. She believes the parents were born in the 1860s or 70s. Uh, his father was not found in the 1891 to 1905 Norca church books. But she believes that he could have left Bidek for more land in Norca around the 1913 time frame. So mm -hmm. there are still some records that can be discovered in there. Um, but she definitely had his path track. And as you can see, those crest branches really were filled out nicely. And, you know, just for, for other people... Uh, we wanted to provide a little more information about Lucas Cress, and we just love to find these interesting things. And, you know, some was provided by the families that you'll see in the slideshow, and some of this was our researchers. Uh, he was considered a hero by Conrad Wirtz, who wrote, I'm happy that you have finally arrived in America. Since you left, I have thought much and often about you. My cordial greetings to you, your wife, and your children. One does not soon forget people like you who have done so many good deeds. Recently, I was in Schilling, and there was talk of you among people who had gathered together that you had once saved from death. They reminded me that I should write to you and thank you for the love you have shown them, without which they would otherwise no longer be alive. You know well that when you served in the commissariat, the governing body of a Soviet translator, you saved many lives. You also saved livestock for the people, though I had two horses their harnesses and a carriage taken for me because not all things were within your power to save. Coincidentally, Lucas is only 16 degrees from Samuel Langhorn Clements, Mark Twain, and 17 degrees from Daniel Boone, both considered to be American heroes. And that entire uh, letter is transcribed on a profile um, that is linked from his. Really great stuff to read. 
And then we do always seem to find families that had tragedy touch their lives. So here we have Barbara Hagel Ellis, who was the mother-in-law of Gabriel Lorenz's eldest son, Lambert. She had 13 children. She lost her husband, Andrew, age 45, to heart failure in July of 1944 in North Dakota, and then lost her eldest son, Mark, age 23, in the Normandy invasion in August of that same year. So, you know, within um, just under a month of each other. Next, we'll look at some of the lines of Gabriel Lorenz. He was said to be born in 1890 in Odessa, Russian Empire, which really was deceiving. His family was from Elsass, uh, Kutschurgen, South Russia. Mm. But, you know, Odessa was used as a generalization of so many of the Black Sea Germans from Russia. His mother may not have been a match to the Black Sea German Jed Match Project, but the family is definitely connected to the Welder Welter family who settled in Canada. And based on DNA, the mother to Gabriel was um, said to be uh, born most likely in Elsass. So that would be a good place to finish uh, looking for further records for her. Now, when Gabriel arrived in the United States, he used an anglicized version of his name, Gabriel Lawrence. And from his descendant, we had his parents' names, Johan Peter Lorenz and Philomena Welder. And here you can see that it was mostly that welter line that was built out. And the earliest ancestor found on that particular line, still impressive with the area that is being researched in, was Simon Welter. And he was born about 1768. And yeah, Gabriel has an intense amount of notes on his profile. So um, a lot of notes and a lot of narrative really good and great information. And then there is some further information that will be passed along to the descendant. Um, you know, here's just one portion of his profile. So, you know, it's, it'll be fun for you guys, I hope, to go out and look at them all and see what's been done by our teams. This part was kind of fun. Now, Claire William Lehman, who is seven degrees from Gabriel, is not only researcher Paul Smith's paternal 12th cousin, but he also married his maternal seventh cousin, Esley Cantrell. And Paul might never have known that either of those people existed were it not for this <laughs> challenge. So he was like, wait, he's my 12th cousin. Oh, wait a minute. She's my... <laughs> Oh, wow. My cousin on my other side. <laughs> We're all connected, aren't we? <laughs> We're all connected. It's, it's one big happy family out here. We always say, you know, everybody on Wikitree is our cousin because you're going <laughs> to, one way or the other, that connection is made, blood or marriage. Now here um, we can get into, it looks like Mike's uh, portion of the, the starting people. Right. And this was our third starting person, Friedrich Eichhorn. He was born and died in Konstantinovskaya, Russia. His wife, Pauline Lukovich, Nibiwakalski, sorry if I'm butchering that, migrated to Canada in 1906 with her sister, Anna, her adopted brother, Alexander, and her children, Adolf and Agnes. And all of this, of course, was given to us at the start. And there was a lot of research done by our team, but they did not find his parents. And, you know, really on this one, unfortunately, they um, feel that DNA testing needs to be done to find the closest family members and look for those similar locations. So, sorry about that, Mike, but, <laughs> um, you know, and if you ever want help with any of that, trying to do the DNA work or anything else, or tips on it, you can you can contact us. Um, you know, we do have some DNA experts that would be able to give you some advice on the best way to, to follow through with that to get some better results. Okay, thank you. Uh, just just uh, one one correction is that Friedrich's wife was uh, was not Pauline. Uh, his wife was Annette, who who was Pauline's daughter. Oh, okay. Just for interest. Thank you. 
Now we have number four starting person was Frederica, who went by Rika, Hogue, Schlittenhart. She was born about 1876 in Anental in the Russian Empire. She was the daughter of Johann Hogue, and that actually the spelling on that was uh, determined to be H-O-G-K. And Maria Magdalena um, Kugel, and had siblings Friedrich, Christiana, Christian, and Sabina. Now, Rika married Johanna Schlittenhart in the Russian Empire before 1897. And they had at least five children, all born in the Russian Empire. And, you know, I know one of the questions was, she was hoping to know if um, we could confirm that she died at sea. And that we could not find confirmation on. But you can see here that the Kugula line stretched out to Peter Pop. And this one was exciting. Peter was born in 1574. His son, also Peter Pop, was born about 1599 in Tübingen and married Barbara Monhuba in 1623. He is the eighth great grandfather of Frederica of Schlittenhart. So, you know, and I have to say, I was um, just so thoroughly impressed with Do You Knee House. And she was able to get some of these lines so far back in a matter of a week, which just goes incredibly fast. And, you know, this wasn't her only early ancestor found. So um, I have to, you know, give her an extra accolade there because she did some really incredible work. And that line just kept going on out the, out the door there. Another early ancestor found was Johann Michael Schlittenhart, and he was the fourth great grandfather of Frederica's husband, Johannes John Schlittenhart. John Michael was born and died in Germany. He married Magdalena Fias in 1800, and he had at least eight children with her. And you can see it actually goes out to Johann Michael's father, uh, Johann Friedrich, who was born about 1739. So, uh, considering the, the records that needed to be searched and how difficult this research is, I think that was rather impressive. But, you know, our researchers do this to me, Anna, all the time. Like, every time you think you cannot be any more impressed, then they do some outstanding thing and amaze me. So, you know, the um, just the caliber of people that are on Wikitree and, you know, and they're all donating their time. I mean, everybody's just doing this out of the goodness of their heart and uh, for the fun of it. And so um, really fun to see. Now, this one was just kind of fun. This was Frida Wool Ketterling. And she's seven degrees from Rika Hogue. She survived a tornado that destroyed their farm in 1964. Frida lived mm. to be uh, 103 years old. Mm. So I'm is that crazy or what? Can you imagine the story she had to tell? <laughs> and how many times she had to tell it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that too. I want a, I want a relative that's 103. Man, I want to go oh, yeah. the brains. <laughs> yeah. And then here was just another fun one. An interesting person we found in the branches. And this was Peter Ketterling. He was born in 1898 in South Dakota, United States. He's five degrees from Rika Hogue. Now, Peter was a farmer and he stood an impressive six feet, nine in inches tall. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it makes you wonder how many other tall people were in those descending lines, you know? And they're mm -hmm. like, how did my son get that tall not knowing? <laughs> Yeah. Be like, oh yeah, you got you got some tall genes in the family. That that's how that happened. Now, fifth here we had was Johann Leonard Stump. He was the only one born in Bavaria, Germany, in a town called uh, named Castell. The pre-Volga origin for this surname was Oberanten Bonheim. This was all given to us by a descendant, and it was the same information that was found by a researcher that communicated with Dr. Brent Mai. Uh, unfortunately, in this one, the church records or parents were not found for Leonard. Mm. Yeah. 
Not yet. I mean, you can always hope. And once again, you know, you work together like this and you get people looking at it from different sides and you leave notes on everything you have found. And, you know, and I know there's also more and more records that they are getting transcribed for some of these areas. So, yes. you know, hope, hopefully in the future of this, uh, they will go further. Now, our team did add or connect 425 <laughs> people to Leonard Stump's line. And that would have been, would not have been possible without the translations of the Werenberg census records by that Dr. Brent Mine and by mm -hmm. Sharon uh, Mitchell White. Now, Dr. Mai is the grandson of Wilhelm Mai, uh, you know, because we couldn't create Dr. Mai's profile and show it. It's because um, <laughs> he's living. And 23, he's 23 degrees from Leonard Stump. So that was kind of fun to look at that connection. And then hopefully Sharon White will join Wikitree at some point and we'll connect her family too so we can see if there's any connection there. Yeah, I think I think our teams just could have kept going with those, you know, those census uh, records. They were just such an incredible help. Now, Philip Reichert was our sixth individual. He was born in Katerinenstadt in the Russian Empire. Her descendant, he was an illegitimate child born to Catherine Elizabeth Hepner. And, you know, I, I hope we have a descendant that's going to be very excited about this because we were... <laughs> Our team member, Pam Kreutzer, did really extensive Reichert research for that location and determined that the only possible father for him had to have been Heinrich Matthias Reichert. Mm -hmm. So this gave Philip ancestors three generations out. So this gave three generations out, adding surnames of Bach, Geller, Falk, and Meyer. So all new exciting names for somebody to research now. Uh, Philip married Barbara Metz on the 3rd of February, 1869 in Shonchen, Russia. They had at least three children, all born in Shonchen. Now, Philip Reichert's son, Isidore, was the third husband of Agatha Wassinger Reichert. His first wife died when they're youngest. And this was just, it was kind of a sad but uplifting story at the same time. You know, Isidore's first wife died when their youngest was just one year old. And so all three of his daughters were put into foster care. But two mm -hmm. of them, Emma and Mary, moved in with Isidore and his second wife, Agatha, and her five children. And they were living basically in a dugout that was built like a basement with a cover and a roof over it. And this was in 1913. Mm -hmm. They had two children of their own together, bringing the total to nine children in the dugout. I know one account said 11, but we were counting nine on the census record around that time. And, you know, but they also took in others. So I'm sure, you know, making it a blessing when they were able to buy a home in 1919. And... You know, Anna, this stuff just warms my heart because they were such brave souls with big hearts that obviously cared for so many and, you know, just somebody to look up to. I mean, just incredible, just incredible people. Now, here we have uh, two people from two completely different directions. We have Aloysius Steinbach. He was married twice. He migrated from Russia to the United States in 1905. His first wife, Elizabeth Geta Steinbach, died 12 days after giving birth to triplets, with one of those triplets mm -hmm. dying as an infant. And then 17 degrees from him, and keeping in mind these are all off of those same lines, um, was Joseph Cushman, who was born in 1755 in Massachusetts Bay, and he was one of two surviving triplets. Uh, Joseph's ancestors were in the New England colonies as early as 1621, arriving from England aboard the Fortune. So, you know, no matter where they came from or what era they lived in, I mean, twins and triplets can be a challenge, both medically and, you know, for the family. So I don't know. It's, it's uh, interesting to see, though, how similar these people can be that came from two totally different backgrounds. Do you have any twins or triplets in your family? 
My grandmother was a twin. We have a lot of um, a lot of twins on my mother's side of the family. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine these people that have like four or five, you know, at one time. I just can't even imagine. Oh, it's mind boggling. <laughs> now here we have three degrees from fart starting person Philip Riker is Anna Annie Wassinger Ball. She had three young boys, aged five, six, and seven, and this was rough, that followed her husband on a short trip to view ice to fill a storehouse in 1906. Now, he wasn't aware that the children had even followed him. They were just kind of sneaking behind him and mm -hmm. told the youngest ran up to let him know that the brother had fallen through the ice. <laughs> By the time they got here, there, the other son had fallen through the ice trying to save his brother and both sons died. Oh. So I, I just can't even imagine that kind of tragedy. No. This was just something a little bit unique we found while researcher researching. And this is uh, D. Raymond Schmidt. And he was a Trappist monk in Colorado. So he's four degrees from Philip Riker. And I had to do a little bit of reading on that just to find out, you know, who it was. And it actually originated from this Armand Jean Le Batrier, um, who founded them. And looks like 1664. Not something you hear very often. No. And then finally, we reach Carl Graybaugh, and he was the son of Carl Graybaugh and Apollonia Kunt. Extensive research has been done by more than one descendant, and I saw this. There is a space page. We love our space pages on Wikitree because one of the things it does is if you have extensive notes and research and stuff from other places, um, you can put it on there instead of putting it on their profile. And that way, when they go to the profile, they see kind of a breakdown of the person's life, where they lived, who they married, who their children were. And then if they want to, they can go to the space page and look at, um, you know, at that additional work that's been done. And Carl, of course, provided, proved to be a very difficult ancestor. And, you know, if I remember them talking correctly, he was born in a really small village that's no longer in existence how it, um, as it was. Uh, where he was born, and so they tried, and they even tried some of the places around it, hoping somebody absorbed some of the records, and didn't have a whole lot of luck. So, um, although, you know, the earliest ancestor on his direct line is Apollonia's father, Michael, our researchers added peripher peripheral relatives, totaling 627 people. So, oh. the hope, that the, yeah, the hope, Hope that the start of a study at his location will help future research, uh, researchers find out more about his family. And, you know, that's one of the other things that we really love about these challenges is because we can take these underrepresented areas like this and just, you know, try and fill out as many people as we can. And, you know, hope that other researchers are going to go researching and go, oh, wait, there's my, you know, great grandfather's profile on Wikitree and maybe come in and add some of their own documents and records they have, which may have clues to other people in the family. So I know 627, I was like, they're not going to get anything on Carl because <laughs> I, you know, I kept following the conversation and it was just not going anywhere with his ancestors. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, 627 peripheral people people. So and I love this too. Three degrees from Carl. We did find this touching article. And um in it it says the story of the love affair of Mrs. Nonanacre would make a good foundation for a novel. She and Gottlieb Weisner were sweethearts away back in the 80s when she was a slip of a girl. Then Gottlieb joined the Russian army and went away from home. He married and emigrated to Canada, where he's been living for more than 25 years. Joanna also married. The spouses of each having died, the sweethearts of long ago have decided to finish the long trail together. Their marriage will take place soon in Steinbach, where Mr. Weisner is farming. 
And, you know, <laughs> they did marry in 1926. They were both 68 years old. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Good for them is what I say. Good for them. Um, I don't know about her origin, but I know Gottlieb was born in Poland. He was naturalized in Manitoba, Canada in 1899, so just eight years after he migrated. And, oh, man, I love hearing stories like this. You know, they get to walk off into the sunset together. So I really, um, <laughs> I really hope they did. <laughs> and, you know, then whether we support wars or not, our veterans gave their all to support and protect our country. And because of this, we like to acknowledge at least some of them. Uh, lasting six years and one day, the Second World War started on the 1st of September 1939 with Hitler's invasion of Poland and ended with the Japanese surrender in 1945. And here are a few that served during that time. And, you know, they've touched so many um, different countries. There's never just one country involved in these wars like this. We had George Lewis Kress, who served in the United States Army. Aloysius Herman Haas served in the United States Army in World War II, earning a Purple Heart. He later became a senior district judge in Colorado in the United States. Leonard Anton Froelich served in the United States Army in World War II as an aircraft mechanic, a bomb loader, and a turret gunnery sergeant on a B-17. He later became an electrician. Well, you know... That's what I do, go from bombing to electrician. <laughs> I, I guess that's logical, right? Uh, Mark Ellis, a brother of Gabriel Lorenz's daughter-in-law, served in the U.S. Army during World War II. He was killed in action on the 1st of August, 1944, in the Normandy invasion. Hmm. Clarence Burgum served in the U.S. Army. Uh, he's eight degrees from Gabriel Lorenz. John George Ketterling, and we'll, I saw that name um, go by a lot this week, Ketterlings, served as a private in the U.S. Army towards the end of the World War II. Brothers Private First Class Lawrence Kuhn and Private First Class Albert Kuhn were both killed in action during World War II. Lawrence was a POW aboard a Japanese POW freighter when it was torpedoed and sank late in 1944. About three months later, his brother Albert was killed in action in the Philippines. Neither body was returned home to Kansas, but the family did erect a memorial in their honor in their local cemetery. Um, more than 1,700 uh, prisoner of wars were lost when that freighter sank, and um, they were four degrees from Philip Riker. And then brothers... Melvin Arnst and Milton Arnst served in the U.S. Army during World War II. Now on Wikitree, as I said, we're all cousins by blood or marriage. And there are currently 29,146,914 cousins connected on Wikitree, alive or not. And while we began our research in Germany, the Russian Empire, and the United States, we also found these locations. We had Canada, Russian Empire, United States, England, Ireland, France, Scotland, and then military service in South Africa, the South China Sea, and the Philippines. So, you know, our, our researchers um, come from different places and sit from home and research a lot of them, but, you know, they get to travel the world with their their research in a way. So um, if you have any questions about the presentation or Wikitree, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or wikitree.com. Don't forget to click on like and subscribe if you want notifications for future videos. And then while the image credits play, I like to take a minute to thank all of the incredible Wikitreeers that helped with this research for this Challenger Week. Every one of them made a difference and helped this be a success. Um, they found an amazing amount of discoveries. It was hard to just pick from the things that they um, found. And, you know, they were a really fun group to work with. I'd also like to congratulate and thank Cheryl Hess for leading such a successful week as a captain. And Anne, I'd like to thank you, too, for letting us collaborate with you and put together this amazing challenge. I'm just so excited that 
um, you know, that we were able to work together on this and come up with what we did. Well, we really appreciate all the effort and time and energy that you and your whole team have put into this. I mean, it's, it's fabulous. And, you know, our ancestry is difficult to track. And if nothing else, this just keeps us talking about it and, and keeps us going. So I greatly appreciate you giving us the opportunity and maybe we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun, huh? I don't know if we're doing any repeaters this year, but who knows? Maybe next year we'll find a way to work it into Absolutely. a new thing. Um, this year good. we're definitely doing our, you know, community outreach and community connections. So, yeah. Uh, once again, I was just really excited to see that we could do such a specialized area and, yes. you know, just see what these challenge uh, researchers could, could come up with. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I wish we had more for you, Mike, but it's a start. At least we put some experts on it. Yes, and I do appreciate all the efforts that were put into it. Thank you very much. Our pleasure, Mike. And, you know, once again, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I think we did have some additional stuff that one of the researchers wanted me to send to you. So I'll take care of that um, as soon as I can. And, you know, we'll let you guys know when this gets posted up on uh, YouTube. Okay. Wonderful. We look forward to sharing it with all the others. Thanks so much.